how can cities become more accessible for a diverse population? So I think one of the things that COVID-19 has done is it's managed to shine a light on some of the inequalities that already existed within our cities. And it's fair to say that many of those challenges that we've seen during COVID-19 were actually chronic challenges that existed before, but we've managed to see them to a much greater extent during COVID-19. So I think, first of all, in terms of thinking about how you create a, a city that is more inclusive and more accessible, you need to think um, about who are the vulnerable groups within your city that potentially could be excluded. And for example, that could be women, that could be you know, people from um, the LGBTQ plus community, that could be disabled persons, that could be migrants. Um, that could be something that you know, we are looking at at the moment in the World Economic Forum, time per urban residence. So there are people who are basically priced out of the market in the urban area that they live in and they're living very much on the periphery or a long journey from the city and they're spending huge amounts of time commuting long distances they may have young families they're not concentrating on their health they have high levels of stress so you know it could be any of those groups of people that and more that um, are experiencing exclusion within their cities and I guess when you think about exclusion there's spatial exclusion so zoning can play a major part in that, you know, that you don't have inclusive zoning, for example, and you have essentially apartheid type housing, if you like, you have different classes of society living in different areas, but you also have economic exclusion. Um, and that, that could be in terms of where, by virtue of where you live, for example, you don't get the same opportunities to get access to employment opportunities. You also have digital exclusion, and we've really seen that during COVID-19, where, for example, education went online, and there was many children in many parts of the world who just didn't have access to the software or the hardware to enable them to get access to education in the same way that other children, just perhaps a few kilometers down the road, could get access to fair and inclusive education. So digital exclusion is something that we see. But also there's social and institutional exclusion. And if we think about it during COVID-19, um, you know, we, we haven't really looked at how the availability of hospital beds or the availability of ICU beds has impacted your outcomes. And if you just look within OECD countries, for example, if you look at the UK versus Germany, you have a huge variation in the number of ICU beds per 100,000 of population between two G7 countries with you know, Germany with around 29 beds per 100,000 and the UK is, is down somewhere around five or six. So there's a huge variation there. And, and that of course impacts our outcomes. And it's the same with general hospital beds. We see this huge variation um, in, within G7 countries and of course within the rest of the world. So, the, the access that we have to healthcare systems, to housing systems, um, you know, to accessible city services is also something that needs to be considered in terms of addressing exclusion. So I guess what I would say is that if you are going to create cities that are more accessible and more inclusive for all your citizens, you first need to understand who your citizens are that are excluded within your city, and that will vary according to your local context. And secondly, you need to understand what are the elements of that in terms of spatial, economic, digital, social and institutional inclusion and develop a comprehensive strategy to overcome it. And I think it's fair to say that some of these challenges I mentioned are chronic. So affordable housing would be a chronic challenge, for example, you know, in work that we did recently, we sort of, uh, you know, went to a number of cities around the world to, to understand the critical challenges that they're, uh, they're facing in terms of exclusion. And of course, affordable housing has come up um, there as, you know, consistently across these cities is one of their number one challenges um, and, and that you know that's not surprising but that was a challenge before COVID-19. Yes COVID-19 has exacerbated it in that more and more people um, lost their jobs for example and they were often people that were coming from many of these vulnerable groups um, and therefore they're needing cities to and governments to try and provide them with housing. So you know, before COVID-19, the majority of the world cities did not provide adequate and affordable housing, which is a basic human right. And since COVID-19, the problem has got worse. But to address something like 
um, uh, housing affordability, it requires a much more holistic approach. We tend to see piecemeal interventions. So chronic challenges require long-term interventions, long-term vision and, long, and a long-term strategy of interventions rather than short-term interventions, which is what we tend to focus on in, in governments. And that means looking at the demand and supply side challenges that are contributing to the problem and seeking to address those challenges specifically in a holistic way because piecemeal interventions will, will, will not get us anywhere. What is a smart city and is it realistic for all cities to become smart in the future? So, you know, a smart city is it's not a new term. It's been around for about 15 years and it really, you know, came from technology companies rather than cities themselves. So technology companies, um, you know, developed widgets and gadgets that they thought they could sell to cities to help them deliver better services for their citizens and create a more efficient city administration. I think what we've seen over that period was a plethora of pilot projects um, being rolled out in cities across the world, but around three quarters of those failed to get to scale. So what we do know is that smart cities, the way it was invented, certainly is not something that succeeded because those widgets and gadgets that um, companies were seeking to sell to, to cities were not necessarily what the city wanted. So whilst problems may be similar in cities across the world, context matters. So you need to understand the local context, the unique context of that particular city, the unique needs of its citizens and the unique needs of the city administration to come up with technological solutions. So I guess what happened in the last number of years is that we've seen the term smart cities has died away quite a lot. And instead, we have seen the technology industry shift, um, which I would argue is in the right direction, to realize that they need to focus on an outcome based approach. So technology is an enabler. Technology is not a silver bullet to fix a city's problems. So if a city, for example, wants to be net zero carbon by 2050 and we'll see at COP26 so many cities will be committing to that as part of the race to zero and of course not only do they want to be net zero carbon by 2050 they want to cut their emissions by 50 percent by 2030. So in that context uh, technology solution providers are looking at the role of enabling technology to help them get there. That can involve digitalizing the electricity grid system for example it can it, it mean using um, smart building technology systems or intelligent building technology systems to monitor energy use within a building and also to, to monitor, you know, for health and well-being, etc. So different solutions apply to the outcomes that the city is looking to achieve. But I think the other side of it is, you know, when we have um, some work that's, that's um, been brought forward at the moment and it, it's really looking at the role of enabling technology and driving a green and just recovery and what we're saying within that is that each city needs to understand what it is they're looking to achieve for their citizens and their administ administration and look at the unique capabilities provided by digital technology in terms of you know helping them get there and focus on an outcome-based planning and implementation of those projects so but also think about the strategic role of data so data within a city can help you uh, make evidence-based decisions but also data can help you, data analysis can help you, for example, deliver better services for your citizens. But I guess what we're also saying is if you're going to, to do this within a city, you need to have the leadership, you need to have the governance model to be able to, uh, to deliver, because without that, you're probably going to continue down the road, which we've seen in smart cities, which is deploying a plethora of pilot projects and they're not getting to scale. So I think what we need to see is both the city taking load, uh, leadership and ownership, and we also are increasingly seeing the technological sector focusing on an outcomes-based approach where they're first asking the city, what do you need for your citizens? What do you need for your administration? And then tailoring the solutions to help with those needs. So I think we've got to a much more healthy place um, in, in recognizing that technology is an enabler. It's not the silver bullet. How can cities become more sustainable? So, you know, this is something obviously cities are really looking at at the moment, and uh, particularly as they're looking to make these pledges uh, on the race to zero as we move towards COP26. So 
So first of all, cities want to be net zero carbon. And the reality is if you are to be net zero carbon, there's a number of things you've got to address, but there's four really big things you've got to address to be net zero carbon. One is you've got to decarbonize your energy system, your energy grid, your energy sources. The other is you've got to decarbonize your mobility system. So all modes of transit. And then you've got to create more efficient buildings, right? So, and that means not just cutting your um, operational emissions in terms of energy use, but also your embodied emissions, which is associated with the building materials and the furnishings that you use in buildings. But the fourth thing is you must be a compact city. So a sprawling city, cannot be a net zero carbon city because of course you're going to have a uh, greater use of cars for example you're, you're going to have uh, you're not going to have the economies of scale in delivering infrastructure so if you look at somewhere like Stockholm versus Pittsburgh for example two cities similar size uh, in terms of population but in Pittsburgh you're using five times more land than Stockholm and it has around five times more emissions than Stockholm. So this is a critical piece of getting to zero in that you create a more compact city. Now, when I say compact, I do not mean building height because if you compare New York with Barcelona, believe it or not, they have similar densities. But what you have in New York is one borough, which is the Manhattan borough, and there's four other boroughs with very high rise buildings. And then you have the rest of the city with very low rise buildings. Whereas in Barcelona, what you have is consistent densities. And that is much more economically viable in terms of delivering infrastructure. And it's also more resilient. So there are four big things that you need to do. But the other thing is cities are also aiming to be nature positive. So that means protecting your green and blue water infrastructure within your city and not just protecting it, enhancing it and developing it. So it means, for example, uh, embracing nature-based solutions to help you on your journey. So it's protection and enhancing of floodplains, for example. It is protection and enhancement of the water quality of waterways. It also means, you know, increasingly looking at how you can get additional biodiversity into developments. If you're developing a real estate development, can you have green roofs on every single building, for example? Can you have green space surrounding it and blue space as well? Can you incorporate biophilia into your building? So you're, it, which is also good for our health and wellness, right? It's good for our physical and our mental health. So I think that to be a more sustainable city, it means embracing this agenda around net zero. So particularly focusing on mobility, focusing on energy, focusing on buildings, focusing on compactness, but it also means um, embracing nature-based solutions. Now, there are many other things that you need to do for, you know, in terms of waste and sanitation and so on and so forth, but they tend to be the principal big things that you need to do. But for a city to understand what they should prioritize, they need to understand their baseline position. So they need to understand you know, what is their emissions profile over the last 20 years? So therefore, what is their projected emissions profile into the future? What do they need to cut? So not only set a target for 2050 of what they need to cut and of 2030, but set interim targets in between that they're working towards in terms of cutting their overall emissions profile. So uh, they're just some of the things that a city will need to do to get to net zero and become nature positive. And what do you believe is the biggest challenge in sustainable urbanization? Um, so, first of all, I think there's obviously a huge difference between cities in the global north and cities in the global south. Um, so, and the, it, what we have in, in the global north is most of our infrastructure and development has already happened. So our agenda is about retrofit. What we have in the global south is actually a lot of the development has yet to happen. Um, so a big challenge for the global south is how can we ensure that they don't make the mistakes that we made in the global north, one, but how can we make sure that it's affordable for them not to make those mistakes? So, you know, what we have been seeing, if, if I look at the example of buildings uh, at the moment, if you want... Um, uh, you know, a, a provider of a building to develop a building that's net zero, 
they also need to achieve an affordable building, right? So ideally they are uh, coming in at the same cost or a lower cost in terms of developing that building as they would a less sustainable building. And it, in some cases, we're not really seeing the solutions at scale um, at the moment where they're at that sort of, you know, um, affordable price. So that's definitely an issue. I think also um, there's, there's an issue around bringing citizens with you on this journey. So within cities around the world, because citizens often think about the cost and there's going to be a difficult period in between where they may end up having to pay more in terms of taxation as we make this transition. So that's difficult. Another thing that I think is very difficult is, uh, unfortunately, when you have something like COP26, you will see a lot of pledges, but no action is taken the very next day. And political leaders often lead it, leave it to their successor. So you're kicking the can down the road. Um, and I think that is something that is a difficulty that we need to try and overcome in cities around the world, that you don't just make a pledge, that you're holding those cities and governments to account year on year. So they are taking the action. And it, the same applies to the corporate sector, that they're not just kicking the can down the road for their successor, that they're actually um, you know, doing something the very next day. Another thing that I do have to highlight is finance, the availability of finance to actually pay for this. So if, if I was to talk to the financing community tomorrow, they would say, oh, we have lots of finance, we have a lack of bankable projects. So what do they mean by that? What they mean by that is there's a lack of projects within cities with the risk profile and structure for them to invest in. So they're not properly prepared. So what we often see is that national and city government lack the, the capacity and the technical expertise to prepare projects in such a way for an investor to actually want to invest in that project. So that's a big barrier in terms of the climate projects that cities around the world need to implement uh, to help them get to net zero it's very difficult for them to be financed because uh, the projects are not prepared in such a way that the financial community will want to finance it. Another thing to add to that is COVID has had a huge impact on city budgets. So even the most frugal city is in deficit because of, you know, they've seen um, their parking charges, for example, ha has plummeted, their uh, toll charges, ha uh, revenue has plummeted, their property taxes or commercial rates has plummeted, their sales taxes has plummeted. But at the same time, um, they have had huge increases in costs related to health or sanitation, for example, um, or e even reductions in returns and investments. So cities themselves, their budgets are severely impacted. So they have less of their own money to want to invest. National government has the same situation. They've had to borrow heavily. So national governments are more indebted than ever. So those transfers that would normally um, take place between national government to city government are going to be constrained over the next number of years. So that means they have to increasingly open themselves up to alternative sources of finance, particularly from the private sector, institutional investors, multilateral development banks, development agencies, philanthropy, et cetera. And in that context, um, they are lacking the capacity and technical expertise to prepare these projects for those investors to invest in. So that is probably the most wicked problem of all the problems that they, they face in, in driving this transition.